First of all, I'd like to thank Zenaida, who's a new member and who brought me this lovely flask, celebrating our teenage years, no doubt, <laughs> preparing me <clears throat> for the trial ahead. Um, everybody else, please note, um, you know, flasks are accepted anytime. Um, so um, I'm here to, uh, to uh, give the strategic initiatives uh, update. And by tradition, uh, what I normally do is I like to explain to people a little bit about the process that we use for prioritizing uh, new activities at, at Crossref. Um, lest you think that we just dream these things up uh, in a smoke-filled room, we don't. We actually have a process um, that we call the strategic initiatives life cycle. And uh, hitherto, it's actually been driven a lot by uh, talking to membership and also by talking to the board. Uh, once a year in July, the board has a strategic meeting in which we uh, actually uh, sit down and try and plot out what we think we're going to be doing for the next years and what the priorities are. And as we actually launch projects, we go through several phases um, of the project, uh, each one reflecting the amount of commitment of resources that the board and that Crossref is willing to dedicate uh, to a particular project. So they go uh, from concept development, which usually happens just uh, without any extra budget, um, talking to members, doing prototypes, putting stuff on labs, uh, all the way up through uh, proposing an actual uh, initiative, uh, specking it out, producing a project plan, uh, developing the system, uh, incubating it or piloting it, and, um, and then uh, turning it into a production service. So all of these things, if you look at them, uh, basically over time, you're going from concept development, you're increasing effectively the commitment and the resources that Crossref expects uh, to dedicate to uh, a particular project. Now, last year, you, typically what I do is I, I put a bunch of the projects that we've worked on on this line, and I show you where they are. And last year, I, uh, I ended uh, with a slide that looked something like this. And if you look at that, it's, it's getting crowded. Um, and we have a whole bunch of things uh, uh, that are either in development or incubation. And incubation largely means these were experiments. Uh, we put them up, people have played with them, people might get interested in them later, uh, but they haven't gone too far and we're uh, you know, keeping them around as long as people are mildly interested, but they haven't, they haven't moved too far. Some are going to move, some are in incubation or in pilot and are probably going to move up to production soon. Um, and then below that you see a bunch of things here uh, that were in development last year. And so the first thing, uh, playing off of something that, uh, that uh, Ed mentioned earlier, is that some of those things that you see in development, one of the biggest things is that we're actually changing the names of them. So the thing that we referred to last year as prospect, which had to do with text and data mining, is now cross of text and data mining. And similarly, the thing that we talked about a little bit about last year uh, in terms of altmetrics has actually uh, changed into a project that we call DOI event tracking. So a few things have actually just changed names. They're still in development. They're still, uh, well, one of them has actually moved to production. Um, and, um, and the other one is still in development. So if we look at some of the new things that have shown up, um, it's interesting to see uh, some sort of breaks from the theoretical pattern of the, of the, of the strategic initiatives lifecycle. For one thing, we've introduced a new API, what we call the REST API. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the reasons that we introduced this, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an important new initiative for us to try and actually unify a whole bunch of new kinds of metadata that we've uh, been gathering and provide an API that's easy both for our member publishers to use, but also for other stakeholders like funders and like uh, institutions and librarians. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've introduced um, this project called Link Clinical Trials, which I'll talk a little bit about. And uh, we've introduced um, a new data linking initiative, which again, Ed referred to briefly earlier, and which I'll describe a little more in detail later. So, um, and then lastly, we have a new initiative that we're wa uh, launching with some Wikimedians to try and reach out to the Wikipedia audience and to uh, modify the Wikipedia um, uh, software to actually help the Wikipedia cite scholarly citation better, and I'll explain a little bit more about that also. But the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about this strategic initiative life cycle. Um, and I want to revisit it a little bit, because one of the things that's happened over the past year is we've had a lot more projects being brought to us by our members. Our members coming to us and saying, hey, we've got this issue that we're trying to solve. 
um, and we think that maybe Crossref can play a role here. And sometimes we have other stakeholders, like funders, coming to us and saying, we think that there is a role that Crossref could play in helping us to solve a particular problem. So the strategic initiatives life cycle historically always in practice has operated a little bit differently than, we, than the ideal that I've portrayed so far. So if you look at, for instance, past projects, if you look at Crossmark, for instance, um, one of the things you see here on the strategic initiative life cycle is the first thing we did at concept development was develop it. Now that seems a bit of an odd thing to do, but one of the things that we've discovered when we're looking and exploring concept is that actually building a prototype of the system first really helps people get their head around it, helps people understand it, and so often what we'll end up doing is we'll end up developing a proof of concept as we're actually developing the concept so that people can actually see how it functions. White papers just don't work. They don't convey enough information. So we end up having to do a little bit of development at the beginning. With Fundref, this was an interesting thing because it was brought to us a large, in large part by some external resources and by one of our members who convinced uh, our membership and the board, this is Fred Dilla, that this was a really important initiative for us to undertake. And so it went from a relatively hazy concept development, initiative proposal, and pr project plan to uh, commitment on the part of Crossref and the board very quickly. And it moved that way and probably you know, skipped a bunch of traditional steps that it would have otherwise taken. And lastly, I just want to look at the Crossref text and data mining system, which is something which basically had its concept developed about six years ago. And we presented it to the board, and at the time, the board was saying, well, we're not sure that this is a big issue yet. Let's wait until we actually have a lot more demand for it. And so it sat on the shelf until there was more demand for it, and at which point we developed it and rolled it out in fairly short order. So this is interesting, because it shows that there are lots of different patterns to the ways that we roll out these uh, projects. And I think that they have a lot to do with the fact that what we're essentially doing is rolling out infrastructure. And when you're rolling out infrastructure, there are all sorts of different things that you have to take into account when you're uh, anticipating uptake, when you're designing it, and so on and so forth. It's a fairly slow process. And I just also want to con uh, compare a few of our projects uh, in the length of time, effectively, that it took from conception to launch for each of these things. Now, if you look at this, the first two things that were brought up when I joined Crossref were what we at the time called author DOIs and later called contributor ID and which eventually turned into ORCID. When I first joined Crossref in January, that February, we had our first meeting to talk about author identifiers. And it wasn't until uh, 2012, October 2012, that uh, ORCID finally launched and a system was uh, uh, released. Crosscheck, on the other hand, actually started conceptually at about the same time and went through a fairly straightforward easy launch process, although it too took a long time to ramp up later, and I want to talk a little bit about ramping up. And then we've got the, you know, the extreme case of Crossref Text and Data Mining API, which was proposed a while ago, and then it never actually got launched until um, just last year. And uh, Fundref, which was something, again, which I described, a member brought to us, the board bought into it fairly quickly, and we launched it very uh, fast. There's also something that we have to take into account, and I'm sorry, I just realized that the black on red wasn't too good an idea <clears throat> on a screen. Um, there's another thing that we have to take into account when we are thinking about infrastructure adoption. And that is the realistic notion of how long it's going to take to actually implement infrastructure in an industry like ours. Now, I um, would love to check this number. A few years ago, I remember working on some consultancy, and uh, one of the things that we were asked to do was try and figure out roughly uh, how long a particular publisher uh, gave a journal, a subscription-based journal, newly launched subscription-based journal in a new area, how long they gave it to turn into the black. And at the time, the answer was something like seven years. Seven years. And that doesn't sound, I mean, that sounds kind of surprising, but it's also not surprising in a way. And when we think about what we're trying to do with infrastructure, which is launch something that gets adopted by everybody in an industry, in an industry everybody, take it up in an industry, you can imagine that we should probably set our spe expectations accordingly, given our experience with something that we know about launching, namely a journal. So typically what happens when you launch a system, right, even when you launch a system, 
In year one, the first thing that has to happen is that that all has to be integrated into manuscript tracking systems, into hosting systems, and so on and so forth. Until that happens, until all of that stuff is integrated into production systems, there's no way anybody, any publisher, is going to roll out something. You have to implement cross-mark in your manuscript tracking system. You have to implement FundRef. You have to do all of these things. And so until the manuscript tracking system vendors and hosting vendors get this built in, until the production systems get it built in, nobody can really early adopt. There are some innovators in year one, people who generally control their own technology, uh, but there aren't that many of the of publishers who do that, at the, who, who, who handle all of that at the moment. And then you get the standard adoption life cycle, the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and the laggards, going on for some time. So you can see that infrastructure, if you look at ORCID, if you look at FundRef, if you look at Crossmark, a whole bunch of these things take some time to roll out, some time to adopt. But once you get past that early majority, then you start to see the hockey stick. You start to see the data being deposited really quickly. Once it's all integrated into systems, you start to see it take off. And this was true of Crossref as well. It will be true of ORCID. It's true of most of our new initiatives. So on to new initiatives. I want to talk briefly about a whole bunch of, a, a few new initiatives. Not all of them, because there are a lot of things that we've been working on in the past um, that, are, that we're still working on, that we're still you know, doing. We're still involved with ORCID, for instance, and we're still working on how to uh, improve integration with ORCID in the publishing cycle. We're still involved with patents and trying to integrate the link patents to the scholarly literature, and Richard will be talking about that a little later. But I want to talk about some new things, some things that are really uh, taking off this year and that we're focusing on. And one of the first things that we're, um, that we're working on is this concept of DOI event tracking. Now, we're pretty good at tracking citations between DOIs and the scholarly published scholarly literature. But increasingly, I think we're all becoming aware that the scholarly literature is talked out about outside of scholarly spaces. It's linked to in Wikipedia, it's talked about in patents, it's uh, tweeted about, it's uh, people um, uh, talk about it in Facebook. And if you think about it, events generically, there are a bunch of other things that happen. Sometimes it's bookmarked, sometimes it's saved, sometimes it's downloaded. And it would be a very handy thing for our members if we were able to collect this data and disseminate it to people so that they could then analyze it and try and figure out, clean it up and analyze it and figure out patterns and, and determine what in fact is going on. Um, I'm not making any claims about metrics. I'm just saying it would be good for people to be aware of how content is being used outside of the scholarly space. So what we're doing is we're launching a, a, a pilot. We're working on a pilot with a, with a group of um, our members. Um, to explore this possibility. It's based on the premise that the infrastructure involved in gathering this data is actually something that could be common and that could sit independently of the value-added services that commercial organizations like Altmetric or Plum Analytics or Qdos are running that actually analyze this and report on it and present on it. So we're working on a project, and we have a number of, uh, of, of, of people on this working group, um, to see if we can actually build a system that will collect common data in a central location and allow other parties, Crossref members, uh, external parties, third parties, to collect this to build analytical tools and reporting tools off of that stuff. And we've been working very closely with PLOS, who's built some open source software called Lagoto, um, that allows us to collect this data and provide it at a central repository. And at the moment, we're running an instance of Lagoto um, that uh, gathers, that we've loaded up with about 11 million DOIs from the past four years. And it's going out and it's collecting data from places like Facebook and Wikipedia and other places and summarizing this and providing an API that others can query to build reporting tools on and widgets and whatever else that they want to build on. So what I'm showing you here is actually an administrative screen that we see. Uh, it's not a front end designed for end users. But what it shows here, for instance, is um, some of the um, most cited articles by the Wikipedia. And this is interesting because it illustrates that Lagoto itself isn't an answer, that you do need analytic tools and interpretive tools built on top of it. Because if you look at that top item um, in the, um, or the, uh, even the top few items in there, they look like they have a lot of Wikipedia citations. And if you go to each one of those Wikipedia citations, what you'll discover is that that is a stub article. It's an article that's been put together by a bot on a particular, um, on a particular subject. 
right? And it's filled out some templated references for that article stub. And so that is, in fact, a probably a quite misleading statistic at the moment, because all you're talking about is a bunch of article stubs put together by a bot. Now, Legato doesn't figure that out. We don't figure that out. That's something that we're leaving to third parties to actually figure out and summarize and make sense out of it. But speaking of Wikipedia, one of the other big projects that we're working on is trying to better integrate Wikipedia citation with the scholarly literature. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is that as we've analyzed our referral logs, we've realized that the Wikipedia is the eighth largest referrer of DOIs to, D, to uh, uh, refer of DOIs in our logs. All right, so this is just behind things that you would expect like NIH, Web of Knowledge, Serial Solutions, Science Direct. Wikipedia is right up there. And the thing that's fascinating about this is that the Wikipedia, if you look at it, only a fraction of the citations in the Wikipedia are linked at all. And of the fr a fraction of Wikipedia citations and scholarly literature that are linked, only a fraction of those are linked by DOIs. So you see there's a lot of room to improve citation practice in the Wikipedia. And so we recently announced that we're going to be working with a group of well-known Wikimedians, Daniel Meachin, who a bunch of you probably know, Matt Sennett, Maximilian Klein, and Dorothy Howard, um, to do two things. One is try and improve the tools that exist in Wikimedia so that people can do things like automat look up DOIs, uh, given a bit of metadata, and automatically insert properly linked and formatted citations. We're trying to improve the tools that, are actually, that actually exist in the Wikimedia. And then the other thing we're doing is we're doing some evangelism. We're going out to the Wikimedia community to talk about the importance of, of citing scholarly literature using persistent identifiers and things that we all take for granted so that we can encourage them to actually start using these tools and to link to the scholarly literature um, and to increase that linkages. So we've been working on that. Another project that we've been working on that's been referred to is something that we call linked clinical trials. Last year, if we referred to it all, we called it threaded publications. But the idea here is very simple, and this is a, a, a project that was uh, brought to us again by a bunch of members who are interested in trying to solve a particular problem, and that is that we can, in fact, look at a thread between publications that all refer to the same clinical trials. So if you've got a set of publications, initial results, updated results, uh, meta-analyses, and they all refer to the same clinical trials, it would be a helpful thing if we knew that, if we had a standard way of collecting that information, and if, for instance, we were able to use something like Crossmark to present that information in a standard way. So here we have a mock-up of a potential future Crossmark dialogue where you see a clinical trials link, and it shows that there's some more information about this particular article, and if you expand it, it shows other articles that refer to the same clinical trial. Now, one of the challenges in trying to do this, one of the things that we're trying to do is address a challenge that we faced when we rolled out other pilots, and that is this critical part. This bit where often we rely on people integrating systems into manuscript tracking systems and hosting providers before we can even experiment with a project or a proposal. So one of the things we're trying to do is figure out whether we can skip this and whether we can provide a mechanism where we can allow publishers to forward a researcher to a form that we control where we gather information during the manuscript submission phase and stash it until a DOI is actually deposited into our system, at which point we'd match up the data that was collected then with the data that's deposited. And so what we're doing is we're working on a prototype that we'll be piloting with this group to see whether they can actually get researchers to start providing clinical trial information when they submit manuscripts and whether we can then link that up once the manuscripts are submitted and then provide this user interface that allows you to navigate documents that are related to the same clinical trial. Another thing that's already been referred to and that we've been working on hard is the small publisher tools. This will be a little bit repetitive. Ed has mentioned some of this already, but 80% of our membership falls into the small publisher category. That means that they have less than a million in revenue. That means that they pay approximately $275 in membership fees. It also tends to mean that they, that of, of, uh, sorry, the other thing that's interesting is of our new membership, of those people who are signing up now to be new members, 
they tend to be small publishers, open access publishers, and from BRIC or developing countries. So this is, the, this is the profile of our new membership. This is the profile of a lot of our existing membership. And the tools that we built when we first launched Crossroads were designed for larger or medium-sized publishers who had technical capabilities that these smaller publishers do not have. And you can see this reflected in DO, uh, DOAJ statistics, where a lot of small publishers do not use DOIs yet. And even the ones that nominally have signed up for Crossref always tell us that it's actually quite hard for them to participate in the system because they do not have the technical resources to do this. So one of the big things that we did that I'd already mentioned was we worked with PKP and the OJS platform because this is a platform that a lot of these small publishers use and we've integrated Crossref functionality into that. But what we're also doing is we realize that a lot of publishers don't use OJS or they use customized versions of OJS and so they won't be able to use this plugin. So we're also building a standalone Crossref depositor that allows you to upload a PDF and it will take apart the PDF, analyze it, extract the references, try and look them up in the Crossref metadata, and then allow you to actually edit those references if, uh, if, if they were extracted wrong so that you can correct them. And once you've got the references, it will automatically deposit these into our system and we'll provide small publishers with a widget that allows them to automatically display those linked references on their pages so that they will fulfill one of the terms obligations of being a Crossref member, which is to link references via the DOI to other Crossref members. On the theme of teenagers, the other big thing that we're trying to focus on and that I mentioned is trying to unify our approach to exposing a lot of the new metadata that we're collecting. We're collecting things like ORCIDs, we're collecting information about funders, we're collecting information about licenses, we're collecting information about where full text resides. And so what we want to do is we want to sort of build on this notion that different combinations of metadata enable functionality. They're not products in and of themselves, they're new ways of combining metadata to achieve different things, different requirements for different stakeholders. So for example, if you think about several pieces of metadata that we collect, we collect uh, links to the full text and we can link, uh, collect uh, links to license information. If you add those things up effectively by depositing a combination of full text links and license links, what you're doing is you're making it easier for researchers to text and data mine your content. Similarly, if you think of an organization like Chorus, where they're trying to help uh, funders uh, uh, fulfill mandates for deposits and things like that, what we can do is we can collect information about funders, information about archiving arrangements, uh, deposit links to full text, and in combination these serve as the underlying metadata to allow uh, organizations like Chorus to provide auditing services for, uh, for funders. And of course the exact same thing applies to another initiative that's trying to achieve similar goals, which is SHARE. So we're working with both of these organizations and they have been helping us to drive the requirements for a new API that allows you to combine this metadata in new and innovative ways for different stakeholders with different applications and different goals. And this is in fact the REST API which you can go and you can see on our, on our site and if you're technically minded I talked about it a little bit but it allows you to do things like this. Show all of the works in Crossref that have a particular funder ID, in this case it's the NSF. Um, or show all of the faint works that have uh, a license that is a Creative Commons 3 license, or in this case, show all of the works by the publisher Hindawi that also have a license and that have full text links. So it allows you to combine all of these elements to provide different kinds of services. And we have a whole bunch of interesting third-party um, tools that are already using uh, these APIs. Just before the, uh, this meeting, I issued a, a Twitter request for anybody who wanted us to feature them on a slide at our AGM, and I said, hey, if you're using our API for something cool, let me know. So this is not a thorough sample by any means. We know that there are other people out there who do it, but these are the people who, we, uh, who responded. And so you have uh, Altmetric, which is one of these organizations. That's, they're already using our metadata, and they may be able to use some of the metadata from the DET. Uh, we have uh, Bibi, 
which is a tool that allows um, uh, people to uh, use their LaTeX and look up metadata and insert re references, linked references into their LaTeX documents. Uh, you've got core search and dashboards. You've got a, a, a set of command line tools for managing DOIs and publications. Uh, Dryad uses uh, our APIs to determine when an article has been published so that they can then make the data associated with that article uh, available to people. We have uh, Qdos who's using it for allowing institutions and publishers and researchers to advertise uh, their, uh, their scholarly output. We have the Lens, which Richard is going to talk about later, where they're linking patents to scholarly literature. We have Mendeley, PKP, PLOS rich citations, uh, PLOS's extensions to the visual uh, editor, Utopia documents. These are just some of the ones that respond and say, yeah, we're using this API, and it's fantastic. Finally, I want to talk about probably the biggest project that we're working on here, and that's uh, most important, and one of the reasons that Adam's here, and that's linking data and publications. Now, data site and Crossref have a long history of collaborating with each other. We've helped each other roll out things like content negotiation. We've agreed on standardizing on various representations of our metadata. And basically, what we've announced is that we're going to take that a step further. What we want to do is we want to address this problem that we've all encountered. Not a month goes by where Crossref isn't invited to participate in yet another group, another workshop, another initiative to try and link data and publications. Now, between us, DataCite and Crossref have a lot of the information that will allow people to do this. And if we work together more closely, if we coordinate our infrastructure, if we make sure that our APIs are compatible and work across our systems, we're going to be able to really accelerate this process of linking publications to data and enabling data publication. So we've recently come out with an announcement saying that basically one of the focuses of our next year is going to be working closely with DataCite to harmonize our infrastructure, to provide common APIs to allow people to do this, and hopefully to address a lot of the concerns that we're seeing out there in all of these initiatives and workshops. Finally, that's the sort of summary of the top projects. Um, we have a lot of other things going on, and if you do want to know about what's going on, and you don't want to wait for these updates once a year from me, uh, we have CrossTech, which is a blog where we post about a lot of the experiments that we're conducting and the Crossref Labs, where we provide links to these and a lot of technical details for propeller heads and programmers. And finally, you can, of course, talk to me or my colleagues, uh, Carl Ward and Joe Wass, who are both in attendance, and, uh, and we'd be happy to uh, help you with any of these projects and give you more explanations. So thank you very much. <laughs>